I'm not going to fight the feeling of me being excited about game day. I'm not going to fight the feeling about me being excited if the Panthers pick up a win. Y'all know me. I'm bringing out the captain's hat and the shades and the blue champagne. He doesn't have a ton of play call experience. Last year was his first year calling plays in Tampa. And it wasn't all sunshine and roses. And my hunch tells me that Derrick Brown has a breakout year in terms of sack numbers. The, the things we hear that they're building the offense around Bryce and we're going to do stuff that Bryce is going to do. And like the offense is only going to go as far as Bryce because we're going to do stuff that he's good at and what he likes. And we're getting all excited, like happy, happy, joy, joy. But to me, that should be basic stuff. In this episode of the Panther Banter Podcast, we are going to talk about what exactly success looks like this season for the Carolina Panthers that doesn't reflect on the record. We're also going to tell you why the Panthers will win the NFC South and why they won't win the NFC South. Of course, I got three bold predictions and at the end, a record prediction. We got all that and more. Let's go ahead and get started. Yo, what up, though? It's Aaron Duncan here with another episode of the Panther Banter Podcast. Thank you for joining me. I know these are very periodic, so I'm glad you get to join on the couch and sit with your boy. You know what I'm saying? I'm rocking 47 on my brim. Um, this is, I don't know what this is. This is a vintage shirt, but it's oversized. I uh, feel like <laughs> one of my daddy's shirts, but it's, uh, it's a vintage. Um, I don't know what brand it is, but I uh, can't remember. But I got it at a thrift store. Pretty st- solid. Panthers from sleeve to sleeve. I can dig it at least. So uh, these are one of a kind. You can't find this in the store, but you could probably find this somewhere on 47. Um, I'm, if I have a code, I'll drop it down below with the link to the hat. I know you guys love it. This is, uh, what is it? Cutteroy. So um, pr- pretty dope. Get you suited and booted for the season. But I appreciate you guys joining me, man. I uh, just want to talk about this. Is my prediction episode. And this is that time of year. This lets me know that. Uh, football is back. Football is here. Um, there's no more delay. <laughs> um, this episode is, I, I hate actually doing these prediction episodes just because I, I told you guys I've been on the, the we going to see mentality and just kind of play it by ear. Taking stuff week, uh, week by week, trying to take stuff what it is and just kind of uh, um, see where things go. I mean, on paper, this is what everything's going to be based off of, but they don't play games on paper. They play it between the white lines on the green grass or turf at Bank of America Stadium. That's much maligned. But um, like I said, I want to talk about in this episode, what does success look like for the Panthers in the 2024, um, 2025 season? Because we're not, we're in a weird spot, you know, not unfamiliar, new coach, uh, new GM at the same time. So that's fairly new. Um, but it's a new regime. We're off to a different start. From what we understand, David Tepper is falling back to the shadows. We can only hope it stays that way. We can only hope that if things don't get off to the best start, um, that he stays in the shadows. And so hopefully we're turning over a new leaf for the better. Um, I know prior coaches since uh, Ron Rivera and since David Tepper um, has taken over the team it's been tough <laughs> to say the least the Matt rule era. We kind of knew from jump that was kind of doomed and he was over his head, but some guys gave him a chance. Uh, Frank Reich seemed like a panic hire at the time. Cause they missed out on Ben Johnson. Um, and we thought that, okay, with the all-star coaching staff, it doesn't matter how good or bad Frank is that his staff will prop him up. Um, and that was a big failure. And so here we are with the Dave Canales regime, the Dan Morgan regime, and we're hoping for better results this time because uh, we're not getting any younger and the Panthers still have not won a Super Bowl uh, as of the year 2024. But what is something I want to see that's successful? I just want to see the coaching staff make quality decisions. Now, this is on game day. This is on the depth chart. This is in practice because, like, we've seen coaches, Matt Rule in particular, Manage the game horribly, you know what I'm saying? Like, manage the game horribly, not not manage the clock. Matt Rule was horrible with timeouts. He was burning timeouts like it was nothing. You, you would have thought that he he had ten timeouts. He was he was burning timeouts like a college basketball coach, and just not managing the clock well. It seemed like we were always up against the play clock. Um, just not making quality in game decisions. Frank Wright, 
there were multiple games where I felt like um, with proper coaching, we could have put ourselves in a better position to possibly win, maybe win. I'm um, the Bears game. Uh, kind of comes to mind and them calling that timeout and then not working and they end up I think the field goal with Eddie that was super super long um, him not remembering to put in certain receivers uh, after the receiver had a great game the week before uh, it's just a, a lot of decisions being made that it just seems like competent basic stuff that are up to NFL standards will work like Frank Wright changing, the, we, we hear in reports that he changed the offense three different times from the course of being hired through whenever, not to mention the multiple change of play callers, the, the firing of him. So you're talking five to six different playbooks that his offense had to go through over a year span. Then we're hearing reports that he didn't put the pistol formation in until the week before the Falcons. They didn't do it in training camp at all. I was there. Trust me. I did not see the pistol. And so just stuff like that, that doesn't make sense. Why would you put stuff in like that that's outside of the norm? And then you got Matt Rule. I, there's a lot of stuff we can run through with Matt Rule. But the thing that stuck out to me was just not practicing red zone properly. Remember when Teddy Bridgewater went on the podcast and outed Matt Rule? And fans tried to crucify him? And I get it. We have loyalists to the franchise. But Frank, uh, excuse me, uh, Teddy Bridgewater was telling the truth. <laughs> they only did walk through practice of red zone, the most important area on the field, the most important thing in the game. Once you get to the red area is putting up points, preferably touchdowns over field goals. And we only did walkthroughs and for what, Friday practice walkthroughs craziness. So just Dave Canales can get to a, a spot where they just do the basic stuff, right? Like it doesn't, we get excited about all the, the the things we hear that they're building the offense around Bryce and we're going to do stuff that Bryce is going to do. And like the offense is only going to go as far as Bryce because we're going to do stuff that he's good at and what he likes. And we're getting all excited, like happy, happy, joy, joy. But to me, that should be basic stuff. It's, we should not have to celebrate that stuff. I mean, I, I'm not mad. I'm not like pointing fingers and saying y'all are crazy for doing it because it's something that's been missing from us. But we shouldn't have to celebrate basic stuff like that happening here but here we are so i just want to see good quality decisions for the team on the field i want to see them not beat themselves you can call that discipline you can call it whatever like the mental mistakes communication errors blown assignments false starts offsides that stuff happens it's it happens it's part of the game i get it but the Panthers being second in the league in mental areas, and I call them mental areas because it was stuff that pre-snap penalties, personal fouls, stuff like that. Those are things that does take talent to correct. Like You don't have to be the most talented guy in the world to know that we're going on two and don't jump until we go on two. You don't have to be the most talented guy to watch the ball being snapped and not jump off sides. You know, so those mental errors, little stuff. And like our offense was so challenged last year that getting five yards back behind the sticks was almost a death sentence. And so I just want to see the players and it's a reflection of the coaches and still in discipline as well. But I want to see the players take some accountability, be more disciplined. Don't beat ourselves on a consistent basis. Because we're talking about three, four games, maybe that the Panthers uh flushed away because of mental errors that I can think of. Minnesota comes to mind. Like I said, Chicago comes to mind. I think that it's just a lot of stuff that happens. And so I just want to see us not beat ourselves with mental errors. Um, this really can't be measured, but I want to see the high effort and the intensity. You can kind of feel it in the preseason, but I want to see that last throughout the season. I know the legs get tired. It, good and bad stuff may happen as up and downs, but I want to see that high effort and intensity, the energy, getting excited for each other. I want to see that happen all year. I want to see us find some personality, find ourselves, have a good time, build that camaraderie and that chemistry amongst teammates. Celebrate your teammates. I want to see that type of energy and effort running to the ball, finishing through the whistle with blocks. Defending each other with some scraps and squabbles happen on the field. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I want to see that pride, that effort, that energy. 
And I saw some of it in preseason. That Bills game, that little when they slammed Mingo, Icky came up and defending him. I like that. Celebrating each other on defense. Making those plays. I, I like that. So I want to see that stuff keep going. Now, the next thing that things that, that, that can measure progress, of course, is Bryce Young showing that last year didn't affect him. I don't believe last year was the real Bryce Young. I just don't. It's, it's hard for me to believe a guy just forgot how to play football. And I know the NFL is a whole different game, but I, it's just hard for me to believe. And he may not He may not even work out long term. He may not be a Pro Bowl quarterback, but it's just hard for me to believe that last year was who Bryce Young actually is. And the film don't lie. It is what it is. It's out there. The numbers don't don't lie. They do lie, but they don't lie. And it's out there. But I, it's hard for me to believe that that's who the real Bryce Young is. But the things that happened last year, the 62 sacks, the the, the coaching malpractice, the, the too many chefs in the kitchen, certain fundamentals he might have been taught or not taught last year that can sometimes become habit. A lot of these young quarterbacks get ruined by coaches. And, I mean, I, I, Sam Darnold was always ter- uh, uh, turnover prone. But him saying he sees ghosts, it's not, it's not out of the ordinary. Nobody ever put it on wax and admitted that. But when, when, when the game is just moving too fast for you, you're not able to process and read the defense of what's going on out there. The clock is moving too fast. You're thinking about the pressure. You're leaving pockets that are clean when you should just kind of sit there because you're uneasy. You get happy feet. You're not comfortable in the pocket. That stuff is damage that's built up over time when you have incompetence around you, incompetent coaching. You start forgetting and unlearning and untethering all the good stuff that you knew and what was attractive about you coming out of college. And you can ruin quarterbacks. You can. I guess I just don't. And I know Bryce has his limitations physically, but it's just hard for me to believe that his composure the accuracy was was just gone out of nowhere. And I just hope that last year he's able to flush last year. We don't see any residual effects from um, the fundamentals kind of slipping because he was leaving some clean pockets last year. The accuracy was spotty sometimes. And so we see that they upgraded the old line. So there's going to be some hopefully more trust there. You won't have 62 sacks, so you won't be feeling happy feet when you go into the pocket every time you drop back. They've worked on his his feet and his in his base for throwing. They have the clock for the 2.7 and all that. They've given him freedom to run. So hopefully he gets back to more of who he is and they can unwind and unlearn some of those bad habits of last year. And so that's what I think progress will be if we don't see anything from last year, residually carrying over. Because I think he's going to have a better year. It, the bar is on the floor. So him showing progress, which is not hard, and him not letting some bad habits from last year show up when things get real. Because when those bullets start flying, yeah, you could practice your mechanics and all that stuff, but instinct, instinct is going to take over. You're, gonna, you're not going to be a robot. You're going to be a football player, and whatever you do naturally and instinctually is going to take over. So I want to see him make progress and flush last year completely. And last but not least, this is big for me. Progress and success for this season to me will be defined by getting impact and contribution from our rookies. Now, I know they are rookies. And I know that last year rookie class overall looking a little split suspect from Bryce to Jamie Robinson looking kind of suspect. But it's just far too many teams get contributions from their first year players. We don't have. I don't need a. I don't need a Puka Nakua year from Xavier Leggett. I don't need a Sam Laporta year from JT Sanders. Like I don't need that. But I would love to see some contributions. I would love to see flashes from one rookie from the jump that lets us know, like, hey, we got us one right away. No, no, like giving benefit of the doubt because, oh, they have potential. I want to see somebody step up and be bona fide from the jump. They don't have to make a Pro Bowl, like I said. But a guy like JT Sanders having a quality year as a rookie tight end with buck the trend for the NFL in terms of rookie tight ends because Sam Laporta's season last year was not the norm. And like I said, not saying he has to have that, 
But breaking out and being that tight end one from jump, the bar is not that high. But being a dependable target for Bryce, being a dependable target in the red zone, stepping up out of nowhere, us not expecting a ton from him from the jump, but him stepping up. You know what I'm saying? Trevin Wallace. He's going to be a rotational guy early on, but making plays out there to the fact that they can't help but keep him on the field in the rotation. Knock on wood, Josie Jewell and Shaq stay healthy. But if his opportunity comes to be in there to start, I want to see him ball out. I want to see him learn on the fly, take his lumps a little bit if he has to. But I want to see him step up and make the plays that he was doing in the preseason, the picks, the fumble recoveries he did in the joint practices, flying around, being involved in tackles. Xavier Leggett, I want to see some explosive plays. I know that you're kind of behind the eight ball on the depth chart because of injuries and all that. But you're going to get opportunities. I want to see him take advantage of opportunities. I want to see him make some big plays. I want to see the flashes. I want to see some impact and contributions from this rookie class. I really do. You know what I'm saying? Jonathan Brooks, whenever your turn is called, we know that we got you marinating on about 350 degrees. You know what I'm saying? Slow. It's 250 degrees. It's slow cooking. You've been marinating, rehabbing. Now we got you slow cooking on pup. I want to see that back half of the season. I want to see you come in with fresh legs, make an impact. Let us know that, okay, hey, we got our we got our guy for the future. Like, we feel good about this. We feel good about this. You know? So I just want to see impact and contributions from our rookie class. Often, like I said, way too many other teams get it from guys out of nowhere. Can we get somebody to step up and, co- and contribute outside of the first round? Can we get a gym? A day three gym like JT Sanders being the best rookie on our team this year as a day three pick would be phenomenal. And going against everything we've known and, and and realized about the Panthers draft picks over the course of the last forever. So do something different. <laughs> do something different. You know? But that is what I think can be a level of success. What would make this year successful without uh wins and losses, you know what I'm saying? Thinking of that standpoint. This video is sponsored by Amish. You know, guys, I'm a sucker for nostalgia, and they really specialize in top-quality clothing of some of the stuff from the good old days, whether it's NBA Jam, Tech Mobile, or just dope, fresh gear for um, pretty much all the major sports. Hoodies, t-shirts, sweats, they really have a unique spin on pretty much anything you could want in terms of clothing. Be sure to go shop with them, and when you do, use my link down below. I'll be able to get a commission based off of whatever you spend on there, and it'll pretty much you supporting the channel, but also getting something for yourself. You're basically helping me help you, because you get dope gear and i get a little kickback from them letting you know that they appreciate me putting you guys on i'm a really big fan of the brand too so it really helps me out in any kind of future partnerships that i may want to explore with them all right so next up with this segment we're going to talk about why the panthers will win the nfc south and why they won't win the nfc south they got three reasons that i came up with i'm trying to play devil's advocate but also give you a little bit of optimism and hope um the nfc south is not going to be great this season so that's not even a chance that um saying why they win it's just a matter of fact of what i expect a lot of people on paper are picking the falcons i think that the dark horse for this division not dark horse not even dark horse they won it last year the bucks i just can't ignore the bucks they have the most continuity they have they have more a good amount of offensive talent Especially on the outside. A right, wide receiver. You know. They got some decent pieces on defense. Obviously, Bowles is a solid defensive coach. They got players at all three levels that can make plays. You know what I'm saying? Young talent as well on defense. Like the Bucks, I don't they're just not a sexy pick, but like they haven't been spending that bag. Jason Like, the uh the GM has been one of the most underrated GMs from Moving on from Jameis, getting all the weapons that they had and knowing Jameis was the issue, getting Tom Brady, getting a ring out of that. But the post-Tom Brady era taking a gamble on, you know what I'm saying? Getting Taking a gamble on Baker Mayfield and it working out and then giving him another contract. And people are like saying like, oh, why would they commit to Baker? He's going to have a regression. No, they went and got Liam Cohn. They saw Baker have mild success when he was with the Rams with Johnny on the spot and they decided to put him in a similar system we'll see what happens they're ter- ter- they're they're my pick objectively they're my pick to win the division but this is about why the Panthers will win the number one reason is the Panthers made improvements 
in most of their weak areas from last year. They couldn't create separation. They went and got a wide receiver like Deontay that's known for getting open. And knowing that he's the guy that we're going to be looking for the most, we have to have somebody that the defense has to account for. You saw it in the preseason game. Bryce was looking at Deontay deep. He could have took a shot, but he came off of his read because the safety went jetting back to help support. The coverage was tilted that way a little bit, and then you come down to Jatavian Sanders. We haven't had a guy that can that the defense has to respect like that. So even if Deontay doesn't go berserk, we have a guy that can be a threat, that can get open on third down. That's dependable for Bryce. When you have a guy like that that the defense has to account for, it opens up things for everybody. Interior offensive line. We know that was 11 different guys. Something like that. I may be exaggerating. I've been like eight. Played those two guard spots, which is crazy. Crazy. We were signing guys off the streets. It it was just nasty work at the interior, mainly because of injuries. But they paid that bread. Damian Lewis, Robert Hunt. They showed good effort in their anchoring. And in terms of depth, Chandler Zavala. He, he, he's been getting raved on by the coaches, had a solid performance in the preseason game as well, the last one. He's looked to make improvements. And so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit better about the depth. And I think they fortified that, and that's going to help in the running game as well. Just got a lot of size around, all around. And so maybe we can lean, lean on some guys. And also, the, the coaching staff is on the same page. I think that cannot be undersold. I talked about it in the first segment. I think them actually being on the same page, whether right or wrong, will go a long way. When you have guys that are doing the wrong thing, the other guy thinks they're doing the right thing, but they're having, they're talking behind each other's back. You're talking about the hunger game mentality. Like, just having guys on the same page, We're going. you know what I'm saying? Like, going the right direction. You know, so I, I'm good with them having a plan, sticking to it, being on the same page. Everybody, you can feel it. You hear the, you hear the players talking about the environment that's being cultivated compared to last year. It seemed kind of awkward. When Wright got fired, you heard Bradley Bowles been throwing sideways comments, talking about kudos to Mr. Tepper for doing the right thing. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. Like, crazy. Crazy what we went through. The second reason, I think the run game will be a staple. They're talking about how one, they want to run the ball. They they put the money where their mouth is. That Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis weren't just for Bryce Young's health. They were for us to run the ball, to lean on guys. We have a downhill runner with Chuba. Miles Sanders, it looks hungry to bounce back. We have a rookie. That's putting pressure on everybody in front of him and Jonathan Brooks. The clock is ticking. And when he's going to be back on the field. And so I just think we have potentially three starting caliber running backs that could have a breakout year. Who knows who's going to end up being the leader this year? I, I expect it to be Chuba. But I I want to see us lean on that running game with that big old O-line. Set up the play action. That's going to take pressure off of the defense so we can may regress or not we'll see but last year so many times they were on the field for forever that they got fatigued they, they they were competitive last year they weren't good by any means the defense but they were competitive but complimentary football starting with running the ball will go a long way i think for the defense but also the offense controlling the clock you know what i'm saying getting in favorable down in distances taking pressure off bryce setting up play action for bryce that run game opens up the playbook for everything else even if it's not great, you just got to be stubborn with it and be consistent. So I think it's going to be a staple. I think it's going to help the offense. I think it's going to help the defense. And I'm expecting a big year from our running backs. I would love a breakout year for Miles Sanders. But we'll talk about it. And number three, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But I think the only team that got marginally better is the Atlanta Falcons. They spent a lot of money. A lot of money. They just picked up Judon, Justin Simmons, 
Kirk Cousins. They, they, Arthur Blank check. He 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 opened up the pocketbook. He did. And on paper, they got better. But Kirk still coming off of an Achilles. Um, Judon is older, and he's their only like dependable pass rush guy. Sounds familiar with the Panthers. I don't really know what they have in the linebacker room. Definitely some youth. But I just think they're the only team that got marginally better, and Kirk is Kirk. He's a competent quarterback. But how much does he move the needle? And so I think that the Panthers are not that far away from anybody in this division in terms of just being able to knock them off. We saw the Panthers last year play tough against the Bucks, who won the division twice, lost nine to zero, could have easily won that game. When you talk about mental errors, chart fumbling out the end zone, TMJ lining up off the line of scrimmage when he should be on, and Blackshear scored a touchdown on that play. There's two touchdowns called back. That would have won the game. We, we lost nine to zero. Played pretty solid in the rain until we give up that long pass to Mike Evans. We ran the ball like crazy on them. Atlanta, granted, it's a different quarterback, but you know how those games went. New Orleans, the first game, Bryce Young, second start, first home start. It was ugly overall, but there was opportunities left on the field. I made a film breakdown on what the lack of execution did. I just think we're not that far away against the teams in the division. Obviously, division games only don't win a division, but that's where it starts. That's where it starts. So I think I think is I would not be shocked to see them be competitive late in the year for this division. But that I think I think with those reasons, I think they're gonna have a chance to win. I think they're gonna have a chance to win. Now here's why they won't win the NFC South division. Number one, the Panthers have a first year head coach. He doesn't have a ton of play call experience. Last year was his first year calling plays in Tampa. And it wasn't all sunshine and roses. Yeah, people tell you that Baker Mayfield had a uh, resurgent year and had comeback player of the year votes, but they won't tell you about the struggles along the way. And and the struggles along the way was with Hall of Famer Mike Evans, perennial 1,000-yard receiver Chris Godwin. Yeah, they had some injuries up front, but there was more talent on the outside than we have here in Carolina. You know, there was controversy about them not being able to get the running game going. He, and, and Canales talks about how they were able to get it going down the stretch. But you talk high and mighty about being stubborn with the run here in Carolina. But the evidence shows that you weren't able to be overall successful last year in Tampa. Now, it could be different things. He might not have had say so in personnel. Of course, as an offensive coordinator coming outside in, you don't. He has a lot more control here in Carolina. You know what I'm saying? So it's 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 question marks. There was controversy. You can look it up about Chris Godwin and why he wasn't being involved. He was injured at times, but there were times he played that only thing he got was like what? An indirect thing against us, the Tampa game. His wife was on social media talking about the lies being spread by by uh uh the head coach about him being injured. And being limited snap wise, no, they just struggled to get him the ball. Mike Evans put up his numbers, but they struggled to get Chris Godwin the ball at times. So how does Canales play it out? Being the man now, calling play. Like I said, this is this will only be his second year calling plays full time, and with a brand new quarterback, a, a quarterback is not as experienced as Baker either. You know, so I'm a little. You know what I'm saying. Dave Canales is not he, I like the happy go lucky, the energy, the positivity. He seems very practical, but we're gonna see because he's not as experienced. So we're gonna find out. Reason number two, I think Icky Aquano is still a big question mark, man. Um, they're gonna need a jump from Icky this year, like a big jump. They talked about the system being getting the ball out quicker, taking some pressure off them when they do those type of drops. I'm sure they'll probably give Icky some help when he needs to. But even in the preseason, and some of the plays weren't his fault, he didn't look like he was just measurably better and under control. 
He was kind of just hanging on, scratching and surviving at times. Hasn't wasn't really tested in training camp because Clowney rushes on the other side. The joint practice was iffy for him, quiet as kept. But Clowney was going against Taylor Moten. Clowney is a left side defense in. So I think Icky, it's he's a big question mark. And we spent all that as much money as they spent on the offensive line, the question marks about Corbett on the interior. Icky is the biggest question mark and could be the undoing of the team. Offensively, at least. Because if you don't, we know if you don't have protection, it can everything, it doesn't really matter. So Icky being a liability could be a reason why the Panthers don't win the NFC South. Last but not least, the defense. The defense just signed a bunch of guys off waivers to play cornerback. They were not here before training camp. They were not here during the offseason. Their experience. But you're talking about trotting out guys that were signed to the team 10, 11, 12 days before week one that's going to be playing serious snaps and starting. That lets me know that you're desperate. That lets me know that you didn't have answers on the roster for corner. Kudos to you for picking up guys and trying to find the answer. But a guy that barely was going to crack the lineup in Seattle coming in and having to be a starter playing starter snaps in week one. I mean, he's experienced, so you hope that it, it translates with the system. But at the same time, what is that chemistry going to look like? There's a lot of camaraderie and chemistry that's built up through training camp and all that. So you're trotting out guys in week one at corner that you don't know what they're going to be. And they're not even talking about the edge rushing. You, you lost Brian Burns. With Burns, at least you had somebody the defense had to account for. He might not have had much production, but he caused them to, to chip, to put tight ends on his side, to game plan for. We talked about the same thing with offense. Having somebody that has to be accounted for can set everybody else up. Clowney, can he be that guy? I told you about him only playing 57% of the snaps in Baltimore. And of those 57, 75 were pass rush downs. So counting on a 30-year-old edge rusher to be your every down guy, your main guy, not knowing who your starter is opposite of him, that you're going to need to step up, that's a problem. That's a problem. You know what I'm saying? Clowney's only had two seasons where he's played every game in his career. It's only been two seasons where he's done that. He's had some injuries in his past. Last year, he put it behind him. He wants it to be his Kobe year, and I'm excited about that. But history tells us that he could miss some games, and if he misses games, there's not a lot behind Jadavian Clowney. And if you have no pass rush, you're putting a lot of pressure on the secondary. A secondary, like I mentioned, that has a corner that you just signed 10, 11 days ago that's going to be starting. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm okay. In a division that has Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Chris Olave, Drew London, uh, those type of guys. Okay, okay, we gonna see, we gonna see. But those are the three reasons why they won't win. Like I said, I'll recap them. The reason why they will win, they made improvements in all the spot problem spots they had last year. The run game will be a staple. They have multiple backs that I think could end up being that lead guy by year end. And number three, they got guys on the same page on offense that will just truly help them get in the right direction at least. You know what I'm saying? Last year was just a a conundrum and a whirlwind. This year, they have guys on the same page. The reason why they won't win, they have a first-year head coach that's not as experienced calling plays as you may like. What's going to happen when stuff Gets the fan. Number two, Iki Kwanu is still a big question mark. Still a big question mark. You're going to need a big jump from Iki. Does he have it? We don't know. We don't. And number three, that defense. Scrambling around to find a corner opposite J.C. Horn. Getting the guy that just got here. Your pass rush. Not knowing who's going to be that guy to step up. Opposite of a Jadavion Clowney who's 30, 31 years old. That is going to be playing a lot more snaps than he's probably played over the last few years. Or a lot more snaps than a 30-year-old edge should play. So we going to see. We going to see. 
hey, if you're still watching this right now, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below and the bell icon. That way you get more videos brought by Necessary Blunt and Sports Talk, NFL content, uh, Panthers content, all kind of good football stuff. So you don't want to miss anything, hit the subscribe button down below. Let's get back to it. All right, so last but not least, let's get into these predictions really, really quick. I got three bold predictions. Prediction number one, J.C. Horn makes a Pro Bowl. And I think this is just a matter of, of J.C. Horn staying healthy. I just need 14 games. 14 games of J.C. Horn will prove and be plenty enough to prove that he is one of the top corners in the league. He's It's not a contract year, but I know he's going to want to cash in. He got a fifth-year option signed. He, know, he, he changed up the regiment, started lifting more weights, trying something different. I think if he stays healthy, he's easily a pro bowler and proves where he's at in the upper echelon amongst the best corners in the league. I got J.C. Horn making the pro bowl. Number two. Jadavion Clowney will not lead the team in sacks. Now, this could be a good thing or a bad thing. It could be a good thing because somebody else stepped up. It could be a bad thing and because Jadavion Clowney is really only pass rush specialist we have coming off the edge. And if he don't lead us in sacks, where are they coming from? And my hunch tells me that Derrick Brown has a breakout year in terms of sack numbers. I, that's what it tells me. And I think it's going to be by committee overall with getting linebackers involved, getting sacks and stuff and stuff to get pressure. But I think Derrick Brown, like I said, this is a bold prediction that Derrick Brown will lead the team in sacks. But Jadavion Clowney won't lead the team in sacks. That would be a good thing for me. If he gets eight, nine, ten, and he's not leading, hey, <laughs> good news, guys. That would be good news. And last but not least, Bryce Young will finish Second in the single season passing record. Not going to break it. The record is 4,436 yards by Steve Berline. But I think he'll at least finish second. Now, second place currently is 4,051. And that's by Cam Newton, his rookie year. I think Bryce goes over 4,000 yards and finishes second in team history for the single season passing record. I think we take a big step in the history of our franchise to only have two 4,000 yard passers. It's almost embarrassing in the modern football. I'm glad we're not the bears. The bears have none in team history, but at least we got two. And at least we're a younger team, you know, 30 years, but still it's time to come into the modern era of football. I know we're going to run the ball a lot, but I still think a competent passing game, being able to hit over 4,000 yards, is a big step, and I think that's my bold prediction. Now, record prediction, I'm not going to go through the whole schedule, but I have the Panthers uh, getting seven wins. Now, a lot of this changed because I felt a little down in the dumps until I saw us in the pre, uh, joint practice. I, I, whatever preseason prediction might have heard me put out earlier is null and void at this point. Ignore that. If you ain't hear it here, this is the official one. I got us going seven and nine. I think six is the magic number, but the optimist in me, I, I'm I'm pulling out seven. The first one is going to be the Saints. I think week one, I think we beat the Saints. I think um I think their man coverage. I think Bryce Young's going to be able to run, scramble a lot. I think we hit some of those one on one opportunities because they run around a lot of man coverage. We missed on them last year. The Chark, uh, uh, he dropped some. Bryce overthrew Mingo a few times. There were opportunities down the field. I think we win on the outside. And we, we move the ball. We score. I, I, Derek Carr, their offensive line, I don't have faith in them. I think we're able to jump on them in week one and catch them slipping. Uh, the second win, I like the Chargers. I think the Chargers with their new coach with Harbaugh, they, Harbaugh is known for coming out and turning things around quick. But I still think that without the lack of talent on the outside to take advantage of where the Panthers are weak in terms of corner and pass rush, uh, I think that we have a chance. Now, we'll see what their defense looks like. Of course, they have Boza. Icky most likely will be going against him. Maybe Moten, who knows, and how we hold up. But I like us in our home opener against the Chargers to win. The third one is the Raiders. So we're starting 3-0. and I'm mainly picking this one because I'm going to this game. But the Raiders versus Gardner Minshew, it's on the road, I understand. But Gardner Minshew, they had Devontae Adams. It's going to be a good matchup with J.C. Horn and Devontae. Like I said, I talked about J.C. having his Pro Bowl caliber year. They're going to probably play hard for Antonio Pierce. We saw them last year play hard for him. But I still think that they're not talented enough that I think the Panthers can knock them off. And I hope so because I will be there. So starting 3-0, it's going to be a lot of delusion in the air based off my prediction, but it's going to be some lumps. 
But our next win I have us getting is the Commanders. I think rookie quarterback. I think that I know the the J, the Jeremy Chin, Frankie Louvu revenge game. But I just think that Washington is not in a place right now um, that they're 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 that good that I don't like us. I like us, so I'll, I'll give us a chance in that game, and I think we're gonna win it. The next up is the Broncos, the Bo Nix Bowl. I do not like Sean Payton. That's been well documented. I think we get them. I like us. I think we're out in Denver for that game. But I still like us against a rookie quarterback. The Ajiro Rivera revenge game as well. Going against his former team. I like us. It's going to be tough being on the road, playing in that environment, the altitude and stuff. But I, I like us. And I don't like Sean Payton. The next is in Germany. I have us beating the Giants. I just don't think Daniel Jones is that good. I don't think they have enough talent overall offensively. I think Daniel Jones, by that point, the writing may be on the wall. Who knows who will be the quarterback at that point? But I think they know that Daniel Jones is the lame duck quarterback right now. And they're just kind of playing the field to see who's going to be the guy that they draft next year. The Brian Burns revenge game, I understand. I like us getting that win in Germany. Another game that I will be in. <laughs> Notice I'm predicting those wins. And last but not least, I have us beating the Bucks for the home game at the end of towards the end of the season. Now that backstretch is gonna be rough. You're talking about uh, uh, the Cowboys, the Eagles. You know what I'm saying? That's ugly. But I, I, I think we get the Bucks once. I think we get revenge on them one time. Like I said, I don't think the gap between us and the rest of the division is that big. I think we get the Bucks once. You know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, I do have us getting swept by the Falcons. Um, I don't think they're that good, but I just I'm not sure. I really can't. I can't. I can't without a shadow of a doubt. Give us that. You know. So that's where I'm at. But seven and nine is my record prediction for the Panthers. Um, don't take my word for it, please. I just I told you I hate predictions. We're taking it week by week. It's a week to week league. If you've been following me enough, you know, I say that it's a week to week league. Games aren't played on paper. So a lot of these teams I think are scrubs can end up being good and vice versa. So we just never know. That's why I didn't pick the Cardinals. I think the Cardinals are going to bounce back this year. So that's why I didn't pick us as a win against the Cardinals. Some of y'all may be thinking, you don't think we're better than the Cardinals? I think the Cardinals are going to have a bounce back year with the healthy Kyler Murray, even though we play pretty darn good about against Kyler Murray traditionally. But a lot of players that have had success against them are not here anymore. A.K.A. Brian Burns. He had some great games against uh the cardinals but yeah man i i just think man this is my prediction episode in the books i really think that it's going to be an interesting year i mean i know that fans are like there i'm i'm not gonna drink the kool-aid i'm not gonna like man just let yourself go that's what that's my advice let yourself go allow yourself to feel how you want to feel give yourself room to be a fan and we you know me is we gonna see but i'm not gonna allow I'm not going to fight the feeling of me being excited about game day. I'm not going to fight the feeling about me being excited if the Panthers pick up a win. Y'all know me. I'm bringing out the captain's hat and the shades and the blue champagne. I'm not going to fight the feeling of being excited just because I've been burned so much in the past. Like, like I said, that's, 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 that's baggage. It's baggage, like relationship baggage. Cause it's because you got cheated on before in a prior relationship. You can't bring that baggage forward. And I understand that that we, they don't deserve the benefit of the doubt. But I'm just saying, if you feel excited, it's okay. You don't have to fight the feeling. You can be excited. You can be happy. You can be looking forward to games on Sundays. You can be looking forward to seeing your favorite players. You can buy a jersey. Be smart when you buy it because you know that be this roster turnover is crazy. But it's okay to be a fan. That's all I really want to say as a closing message. You know what I'm saying? It's okay to feel how you want to feel. It, like I said, feelings are natural. Excitement is natural. This is your favorite team. Remember that. Remember why you like this team. Remember why you became a fan. It's okay to be excited. Allow yourself to be excited if you want to. If you want to be pessimistic, that's fine. But don't have to rain on everybody else's parade that's enjoying the ride just because that you've seen the Panthers have a a a, a slide before. Like how much long how long is it gonna take you for you to start actually to believe it? Because like 
let's say we go to the Super Bowl this year. If you were just doubting the Panthers because they've let you down so much in the past, you're going to miss and not enjoy the whole ride to get there. Not saying that they will, but sometimes the destination is not the end game. The journey is more important than the destination. So if you don't allow yourself to enjoy the journey, you may not even get to fully enjoy the destination when you get there. All right, man, that's just me dropping a little bars here in wisdom. I appreciate you guys watching. Make sure you guys are subscribed uh, to the channel. Give the video a thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. If you're watching, if you're listening to this, the audio experience, I really appreciate you guys on that with on uh, on the, uh, your favorite platform, whether it's Apple, uh, whatever, Spotify, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, make sure you are subscribed there and uh, leave a review. Leave a review on that as well i really appreciate you i'm gonna push the audio a little bit more um i'm excited for the season man i appreciate you i'll see you next time peace